All right. Uh, welcome, everyone. Welcome to the Patrick Global Health Innovators talk series. Uh, I'm Rohan Sukumaran, Research Manager at Patrick Foundation. And uh, we welcome you to join our website at uh, patrick.org to know more about uh, our initiatives and uh, kindly join our workspace at tiny.cc slash Patrick Slack to work on digital pandemic response for the future epidemics. And uh, if you'd like to follow the previous research in this talk or to see the recorded video, uh, please go out to tiny.cc slash PCF research talks. So with that, I'd like to welcome my co-organizers as well. So we are a group of people based out of Pacek and uh, basically based out of the US, Europe and uh, India. Uh, so thanks to all the co-organizers for putting this talk together and extremely thankful to all the speakers who agreed to spare their time today. Um, just a brief bio of what this talk is about. Uh, so this is a bi-weekly research meetup which we conduct by bringing in speakers who have been creating an impact in the digital health ecosystem with the help of uh, AI technology, software, and more. And the another intention behind having these uh, talk series is to drive collaboration on digital tools for health or AI for health with cross-disciplinary efforts uh, based on computer science, medicine, bioinformatics, economics, and much more. So we welcome any collaborations uh, that is interested in these directions and towards helping us uh, overcome this pandemic together. So with that, I'd again like to thank the two speakers who have agreed to speak with us today. And um, Kristen, I'd uh, hand it over to you to invite Dr. Hudson. Great, thank you so much. Um, so uh, Dr. Nisi Hudson, I've only known for a short time, but it's already been amazing. Um, and she's uh, organizing these meetings with us now, which is so fantastic. Um, so uh, in her day job life, uh, she works as a research scientist at Alonco, um, which is a, a pharmaceutical country, um, country, <laughs> pharmaceutical company. Um, uh, but we know her from um, her amazing work um, hosting Hood Medicine, which is focusing on disparities in the pandemic. Um, and for creating greater equality for black and brown people. Um, and with that, she makes infographics. She hosts this live podcast that's really doing amazing things, doing outreach, um, directing scientific communications. Uh, her background in brief is that she completed her bachelor's in biology at MIT and uh, her PhD at computational biology at the University of Louisville. So, with that, uh, I am very excited to uh, hear uh, what Dr. Hudson has to say. Thank you so much for having me. Let me um, show my screen. I'll just stop my screen. Okay, awesome. Can you, can you see? Right yep, we can see it. Awesome. Thank you. So I thought um, I would talk a little bit about the things we do around public health education during the pandemic, um, because a lot of what I'm excited to work with um, with Path Check India is helping sort of craft that messaging that will, you know, compel various communities to, you know, take heed of, of measures to mitigate risk for transmission and spread and also um, help people understand a little bit more about vaccines so they'll be you know, less hesitant and we can drive adoption and hopefully increase the vaccination rate. <clears throat> so um, like Kristen said, I'm the uh, chair and science director of Hood Medicine. Um, essentially, <laughs> we are just a group of uh, scientists, physicians, hackers, and other sort of geeks. We were founded by a group of MIT alumni <clears throat> Um, and last year, actually, tomorrow is our one-year anniversary, so that's really exciting. Um, <laughs> we're dedicated to reducing health disparities and, and curbing the spread of disinformation and misinformation during the pandemic. Um, our vision is a world where we value the health of every community, and our mission is to just use science and technology to help historically marginalized communities um, find the care that they need. So some of our programs right now in terms of public health, we're obviously focused on the pandemic, um, primarily as vaccine education and um, helping combat some of the uh, misinformation and um, vaccine hesitancy in black and brown communities in the US. Um, and our mobilization sort of ground up works again are, are um, also what sort of brought me together with this group because 
Um, we have a partner that um, Project Global Impact that um, creates, you know, um, mobile vaccine units and um, our other partner, Dr. Peter Hotez, um, is a virologist who developed um, a vaccine that's now going through regulatory approval in India. So we're trying to like put all those pieces together. We have a vaccine, we have mobile units. Um, and so trying to build that network so we can try to help get, you know, get help on the ground in, in rural India. Um, and then some of our advocacy um, here at home includes, you know, health disparities research and building community care networks for people who have been left behind um, in terms of our healthcare systems. Um, and then our science outreach, um, we, like Kristen said, we have podcasts and infographics and um, also do a lot of STEM advocacy where, <clears throat> you know, a part of what we're doing is addressing the contemporary issues, but also trying to um, do our part to help train the next generation of, you know, black and brown scientists and carers that can become, you know, the, the carers of the community and um, trying any and all ways to try to remove that bias and help people. Um, so our scientific communications team right now, we have um, several people who develop content for different, um, different, <laughs> different venues. We have the Black Epi, who is um, another MIT alum, Doug Slaughter, who's a CDC epidemiologist. And so um, we started sort of putting out communications around that, um, people involved in environmental health and communications and um, mental health as well. And honestly, what we're what we're trying to do right now is combat the <laughs> the COVID pandemic and the pandemic of misinformation. Um, I think, especially for our communities, messaging has been the biggest hurdle to containment. It's probably true everywhere, really. I think um, because of where we are globally um, as a civilization, you know, it's difficult for scientists to um, communicate directly to the public, but I think we're getting better at that, right? The pandemic has pushed a lot of us, all of us that are here, right? To, to um, make sure that we can inform the public on the things that they need to know and build that trust directly, um, uh, absent of all the systems that have engendered the mistrust. Um, we know in this particular pandemic, social media is the vector, right? For the spread and, you know, Black, Indigenous, and um, people of color, those communities and other exploited populations are definitely more vulnerable to spread disinformation because of the overwhelming distrust they already have of these systems. And um, at least where, where we're concerned, you know, minority communities need targeted intervention for, and vaccine education because, um, you know, I think in the beginning we talked a lot about hesitancy, but now we're, we're just dealing with out and out resistance, you know. Um, so uh, the challenge is that lies spread faster than the truth, <laughs> unfortunately, especially in the digital space. Um, the Media Lab at MIT published a report in science um, about analysis they did of verified true and false news stories that were on Twitter. And um, all, of, all of the data that they analyzed, they um, determined that false news reached more people than the truth, obviously. Um, the false news diffused to um, anywhere from a thousand to a hundred thousand people, and the truth barely got past a thousand people. And then lies spread faster than the truth as well. Um, some of the solutions, I think everyone is concerned about this right now in this space, and you know they're also working with Google's Jigsaw to develop different user interface interventions, which I think we've all seen on social media, right? Like the primers to consider accuracy of shared posts and different tips that they have out there. And, you know, they have shown that people in, least in the studies that they did were 20% less likely to share a fake news story. And so some of these um, may help. I mean, I don't know if, if the effect will wear off over time, but there's a lot, there's a lot to combat, right? So there's, there's a piece where we need to be able to use technology and, and AI to figure out ways to not only curb it, but like also ways to regulate its origins, right? Because this, is a, this information is deliberate. Um, and also to, to 
at the on the user end, you know, prevent that, um, prevent lies from becoming reality, right? And in terms of what we're doing and the things that, that I want to start thinking about with your group about what's needed to communicate, obviously the basics, right? The um, information about the virus and the vaccines that people understand what they are, what they do, and um, in a basic relatable way so that they can um, take heed of, of the recommendations we're giving them and, and be more open to vaccination. Obviously like CDC, WHO guidelines, those things, um, information about herd immunity and social distancing and masks and why and how they mitigate the spread so that they understand there's a reason, you know, why you should probably keep your mask on until further notice. And then also, you know, it's important that we, especially now um, with all of the different socioeconomic, um, healthcare, political crises that, you know, the pandemic has caused, making sure people know where to get aid and, and resources as well. And so for us, the way we kind of work through how we approach our messaging is obviously we have to start with, you know, the things that people fear, what these stigmas are, where it's the root of their, their distrust. In our case, I mean, we could point to a myriad of things. We don't have the time here. Um, but for black and brown communities in America, the, the distrust is well earned. So, you know, what we try to do is acknowledge that and contextualize it so that people kind of understand more about the way that science works in the modern era, that, so that people understand there aren't mad scientists anymore, you know? <laughs> and it's hard, it's a hard concept to impart because obviously we still have doctors who are like sterilizing people in detention camps just last year. So it's hard to, to make that um, distinction about the way that science works and is reported and regulated um, versus, you know, the, the face of sort of medical research, which for most people is like their physician, essentially, they don't have a lay understanding. Um, some of the things that we have to consider are the health disparities, the healthcare access, equity, misinformation, I suspect because of maybe some of the socioeconomic barriers um, in India, there's probably a lot of disparity um, issues there as well. So the, like, those are the things you need to start to think about, like, what are the barriers for people? Like, what are they saying about why they don't want to take the vaccine? And then for us, we try to just plan like a, actually like a suite of messages, um, different ones that, you know, build trust, you know, where we sort of try to um, define the issues and there, you know, that's where we find ways either directly or, or you know, implicitly to, to make a connection with the audience, to um, define the problems as we see it. That's where we find the common ground with them. That's where we can move into offering solutions. I think identifying villains is really important in our case because people need to understand how the systems are set up to perpetuate oppression in, in society. Um, and then that, I, I feel like sometimes when we, when we establish that, it kind of, um, it allows us to be more um, effective with sort of then moving to promoting like a call to action, whether it's about, you know, vaccines or either just self-care or advocacy, any of those things. So we're always kind of thinking like of different lines of messaging, like for us, you know, considering what, you know, what our challenges are, we always have so a vein of social justice graphics, right? Um, so that our audience knows that we understand what they're going through, we also go through it. Um, we have infographics, obviously, to try to explain um, uh, the science around the pandemic, all of people's questions about different medical aspects and um, hysteria. Um, and then we have ones that are, you know, focused on health advocacy, and then also ones on engagement, which to us is kind of like, those are the cheeky ones, those are the jokes, you know, like the memes, if you will, where people, um, we can find ways to use humor to plant the seeds of messages for people. We like to keep it simple, 
um, always go with the law of threes. Um, you know, the, the way that we consume social media, it's so, it's so quick, it's so fleeting that you have to be able to, you know, engage people. They're not going to read a lot. We have attention span as goldfish. Um, so that's our overarching sort of um, goal. And so in terms of like social justice, you know, um, graphics, you know, for us, you know, you know, it relates to sort of the history of America and the things that people are familiar with in terms of their challenges. And we try to, you know, personify the virus as much as we can and to, to take the focus away from, you know, what's going on within the, the human level. You know, we try to focus on um, the battle of the species that this really is. Um, and, you know, so that, that sometimes means that we, we make, you know, memes about COVID going to the club with people, you know, because we want people to know, you know, as much as, as much as there's strife and nonsense in the, in the world, this is really about us, us and the bug. Um, and so we try to use, you know, relatable things. We have infographics where we try to, um, use simple concepts to explain to people how things work um, so that they can take it and, and use it to explain to other people and they, they feel confident, they understand. Um, and then, you know, we have, you know, health advocacy and also, like I said, like identifying villains. You know, we want people to understand in our case, you know, that we understand their challenges. And then, you know, we have you know, our memes. So, and in our, and so this one, you know, it's, it's particularly, um, you know, so perfect because <laughs> among, you know, black people, um, this whole thing of like potato salad, not trusting everybody's potato salad, that's, that's like an indicator of like, what, what, how you judge someone's like cleanliness and hygiene. <laughs> And so and, and everyone, you know, kind of kind of gets that, you know, like the potluck, I don't trust that, you know, kind of thing. And so, you know, those are the those are the things that we try to like um encourage people to think about. Like what is the potato salad for your culture? Like what is it that people like can grab onto? Like there's a shared experience. Like obviously black people are not a monolith, but I, I guarantee you without any data, everyone knows about the potato salad. Um and there are things that, you know you can use about everyday situations to start to plant seeds with people, um, to direct them to do things, to mitigate transmission and, and risk. So, you know, that's kind of where we are and that's the work that, you know, we hope to do with your organization. Um, so thank you for allowing me to share a little bit of that. Thank you so much, Nisi. That was amazing. Um, and your infographics are so beautiful. I'm <laughs> kind of in awe of them. Um, so I, <laughs> I think we're going to hold off on questions to the end, um, just so that we can have, you know, everyone discuss them as well. Um, but I encourage um, people to put questions in the chat if they have them, and we will read them off at the end and have our speakers address them as we go. Right. Uh, so once again, thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Hudson. And uh, I, we completely agree on the social messaging part. And uh, our group at Patrick over here is definitely working on uh, different ways to reach, uh, make outreach and make sure that our message is well heard. And also focusing a lot on privacy and making sure that to mitigate bias as much as possible. So and would love to discuss more about it as well. Uh, with that, uh, thank you. Thanks once again for joining us on uh, this call and that I'd like to welcome our second speaker, uh, Dr. Sriram Ganpati. Uh, Dr. Sriram is an assistant professor at the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. Uh, his research is primarily focused on signal processing, machine learning, neuroscience, and uh, recently his project Kovisura has been getting a lot of attention, which looks at detecting COVID based on uh, cuff sounds. And uh, I'm sure we'll learn more about it from uh, Dr. Sriram today. And a uh, bit on his background, he did his PhD from John Hopkins and uh, was at the IBM Watson Research Center in New York for about four years before joining as a faculty member at IASC. 
so thanks again, Dr. Sriram, for uh, accepting our invite to speak in this event. And uh, uh, I would like you to take, take the floor. Thank you, Rohan, and uh, thank you to the Patrick Foundation for you know inviting me to give this talk. Uh, and I would also once again like to thank uh, Dr. Hudson on this uh, uh, very uh, graphical talk on, on how to uh, spread misinformation. So with that note, let me try to see if I can share my screen. Uh, let me see if it works. Uh, are you all able to see my screen? Yeah. Okay. So uh, thank you again for uh, you know getting uh, uh, in, inviting me into this session. So my talk is uh, on a slightly different note than the uh, first uh, speaker, but it's going to be related certainly to the pandemic and certainly to how we could uh, develop some uh, technologies around this for you know use of uh, machine learning AI uh, as well as for uh, some uh, diagnostics of the COVID in general. So myself again, I'm a faculty at the Indian Institute of Science here in Bangalore in India. And this work is basically a part of our uh, lab's efforts for the course of the last year. So let me just, actually maybe I'll do a slide play. Hopefully that will be fine. So no, right? So you are not able to see the slide, right? Um, no, it's a black. Yeah, it's yes, yeah, we can see it right now. Now, now it's visible, I suppose. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So uh, let me just uh, get started. So uh, since the ninth, uh, December 2019, of course, we have been, you know, behind the pandemic. We have been, you know, what I would use the word as uh, more or less like reacting to the virus, uh, you know, with the different variants that are out there, uh, with a higher fatality ratio with the new variants. Uh, and uh, certainly the, uh, uh, the viral spread across different geographies, different cultures and some societies that has happened uh, all through the course of the last year and a half almost. So one way that uh, uh, many of the uh, recommendations from policymakers, from international bodies, uh, from World Health Organization and so forth has been the message to keep testing, to understand how far and how wide the virus has gone and that could you know, allow us to implement other policies of say self-isolation for quarantining and other efforts to arrest the spread of the virus. So I'm gonna focus on that part of the testing for this uh, uh, 15 minute talk. So what do we have across uh, major uh, countries in the globe, the, uh, the current standard for testing is what is called the reverse transcription polymerized chain reaction. So I do not plan to go into all the details of how the test happens, but it's really going behind the genomic activity of the virus, trying to amplify that and detect it under the chemical process. So it has what is called high sensitivity and specificity. I will come back to define these metrics for the sake of the broad audience that we have today. What you could understand perhaps is that this has basically the good levels of accuracy that one would expect. But in many places, particularly when there is a surge in the virus, when there is a wave, so-called, uh, the uh, processes are often lagging, they are time consuming, they take a few days sometimes. Sometimes the tests become expensive in some parts of the world uh, for uh, people to afford it and therefore they do not uh, go ahead and do the testing primarily because of the cost involved. Sometimes it is due to the exposure that you fear, the, uh, the sensitivity to feel that you get outside, you, you work with the medical professionals who do these tests and therefore you also get further exposed. And sometimes this pure hesitancy to visit a health center or a clinic to undergo the test. So put it all together, you know, there are a lot of the so-called hidden infections out there which are uh, massively unreported and during a surge, these all contribute to the so-called uh, enhancement of the viral surge. So even with the vaccinations, we are starting to see with several countries, like for example, the UK yesterday or the day before has announced a delay in opening because of the new variants causing some trouble out there. We have seen the surge of new variants in India here. And also even with vaccinations, we are you know, at least in the new normal of uh, how things are going to progress. In the near uh, future, there is uh, going to be a, a rapid and remote testing requirements of population scale. 
So things of low cost, rapid remote testing without contact and on a regular basis uh, is of uh, immediate requirement. For example, a couple of days ago, our university back in here in India, although has vaccinated most of the uh, students and the faculty members, has announced that there is going to be a weekly random testing uh, undergoing in the hostels, in the departments and so forth to check for the viral surge. So this is sort of the new normal, so as to speak, and therefore, you know, population level scale of uh, testing of uh, uh, virus is of immediate need. So the question at the bottom is what I would like to focus on the rest of the talk, which is essentially, can we try to use some artificial intelligence based solutions to uh, improve on the cost side, improve on the speed of testing, and also improve on not having to have any regular physical contact. So a quick uh, roadmap, what I will try to do in the 10 to 15 minutes is essentially describe the hypothesis, uh, show what data we are collecting, uh, uh, hopefully show some models and classification results, and then you know, the key summary from what our findings are. So what is the key hypothesis that uh, uh, we are trying to drive? So about a year ago, a bunch of us were working on signal processing, speech understanding, acoustic signal processing, uh, and also medical professionals at the Institute. We tried to get together to, uh, to ask this key question. Uh, the COVID-19 seems to be a virus that also affects the uh, respiratory pathway in particular the lungs, the, uh, the pathway of uh, respiratory nature, including the nasopharynx, as well as the trachea and so forth. So the question then is that, does this infection in the body also result in some uh, changes in the signals that are coming out of the system? So here the system view of this is that the lungs and the respiratory tracts are also responsible for generating these sounds like the voice, the speech, as well as the respiratory sounds of breathing. Now the question is, can you reverse engineer to identify the status of the system through these signals? So this was the view that we tried to you know, form a formal hypothesis about. And we, at the moment when we started around a year ago, we knew that the symptoms had the respiratory nature, like breathing difficulties like cough and uh, many subjects had also complained about uh, having trouble sustaining voice for long periods or having difficulty in in speaking at a faster rate. So with all these insights, we then asked, uh, you know, how do we test this hypothesis? You know, as in the case of any scientific question, the, uh, the question was uh, moved to, you know, how can we formulate this as a problem? How to collect the right data for this? And then how to develop some algorithms and models around this data to see if the hypothesis can be validated. So that's really what we outset uh, to do uh, about a year ago. And these are the three stages of this so-called uh, uh, project that we undertook. So the first step was, uh, you know, primarily the, the use case was in our view uh, as to not to have this basically collected in a isolated place or a centralized place or by using sophisticated devices because these we realized are going to be, you know, uh, uh, difficulties when the technology is going to the field. So we wanted it back at the user's hand. So the user with a smartphone, with a tablet or any other mobile web connected device is able to uh, uh, potentially test himself or herself. So that was the goal that we had. And uh, for that goal, we also collected data in that same manner. So the whole processing was to, crowdsource this initiative to allow just a website to be propagated and uh, people, the volunteers uh, who wanted to contribute data could log into this website and, and provide the data. I will come to exactly what data the folks provide through the tool. So once this data was generated, we also made sure that complete privacy or identity of the participant is protected in the process. No uh, physically, personally identifiable information is collected, only the age and the gender and the broad geographic location in terms of the country or the state is collected. Nothing else is recorded in the tool. Of course, the next stages of this uh, would be to look at the data, analyze the uh, data uh, using machine learning models and try to build tools to provide diagnostics. And the last step, of course, in this, uh, in this uh, process would be to take it to the regulatory bodies in different, uh, uh, you know, in particular, we were targeting India to take it to the regulatory bodies to uh, see the potential for this and go through the approval processes. 
last but not least we are also you know collecting the data and and part of open source research to propagate and progress faster in this uh, uh, in this domain we also made sure to try to uh, release parts of the data as and when they get collected to the broad research audience uh, who may be interested in using this data for their own research. So we did not uh, want to claim that we can do the entire pipeline all by ourselves. You know, there may be practitioners, uh, researchers, scientists out there who are much more well-versed uh, in analyzing these signals. And we thought that maybe you know, we could also provide them the data that we are collecting at a timely basis. So where we are right now in the whole set of the stages is somewhere in between say all the three, actually I should say the data collection is ongoing. We uh, constantly see folks uh, participating into the data. The machine learning analysis is uh, progressing uh, while uh, the data collection is ongoing. And we are also preparing the assay for uh, approval uh, in the regulatory bodies in, in the country. So let me just uh, take the next 10 minutes or so to uh, give more details about what this is. So first off, what data do we collect? So the data do we collect is, as we mentioned, through this website, which is listed on the side of the right side of, the, uh, of this particular slide. And the data we collect is of acoustic nature of nine categories. So it involves two types of breathing, two types of cough sounds, uh, and three types of vowel sounds like R, O, and E with sustaining uh, the sustainment of the vowel as much as possible for the user. And then a counting exercise, we typically ask the participants to count from one to 20 in a normal and a fast pace. So the entire thing is all done using the microphone present in the uh, user's device, be it a cell phone, a tablet, or a laptop, uh, the microphone in the device is used to collect this data. So each category, there is a sample also provided, an example for users to get acquainted to what is needed to be provided. And then the user can press record and then he or she can contribute data that way. In addition to that, the tool also records some symptoms of the, of the participant. Uh, if they are having some cough, some cold, some other uh, uh, symptoms of breathing nature, Along with it, we also collect uh, uh, information about pre-existing illnesses. So if they have a, a respiratory ailment like asthma or a pneumonia, if they have other uh, comorbidity, this is also recorded in the tool. In addition to all that, you know, if the COVID uh, uh, testing has been done and the status of the COVID testing is uh, known to the user, the user can also enter the COVID test uh, results. So this is all is collected and the entire process for each user takes about five to seven minutes. So what we did then was, you know, with word of mouth, working with the hospitals in, in Bangalore, in Mumbai, and also uh, in other parts of the country, we are trying to also collaborate with hospitals to really collect data. So I'm just going to give a snapshot of the data that is uh, uh, present in the tool as of the 7th May. So this was what we have used for our analysis. Uh, that I will be presenting in the rest of the slides. So about 1400 samples, there was a, a huge bias, as you may imagine, most of our uh, tool development, our, our collaborators were all based within the country. So we had about 89% of the data coming from, from India. And of course, the next uh, uh, source of data was from the United States. We had about five to 7% of the data coming from the US. And what we then did was we split the data into these two categories. At the end of the day, we were trying to look for diagnostics of COVID. So we put together, let us say, the category of COVID, which is consisting of folks who are mildly symptomatic with moderate symptoms, and also folks who have tested positive but have been asymptomatic. So this is the so-called COVID class. And the non-COVID class is, of course, the major uh, component of the data, about uh, 80, 85 to 90% of the data was from the non-COVID so-called class. What the non-COVID class contains is uh, predominantly healthy participants with no comorbidity or respiratory ailments. And also a subset of them were exposed to the virus, but were not positive for the virus. And they were also a subset of the uh, participants who had pre-existing respiratory ailments. So the usual uh, you know, data collection protocol that we followed, we got it approved through the regulatory bodies to collect this data. And uh, there was a little bit of a bias with more male participants coming into the pool. Uh, there was also a bias that more younger population were participating in the uh, 
recording process, which was typical of the, the mobile use uh, community in the country in some sense. And then what we did is the usual machine learning approach of trying to take a portion of the data, build some models around it to perform this two-way classification, and then held, uh, held out a portion of the data to perform some blind testing. Right? So the standard machine learning tricks were applied to this. So we tried to put together uh, the classification setting using some machine learning tools, which for the sake of brevity, I'm not going to go into the details of. But what we fundamentally do is take breathing samples, cuff samples, and speech samples that are coming through the tool, along with some features of the symptoms that the participants are uh, recording through a questionnaire sort of a form, put it all together into this classification setting. And finally, all these uh, cl classification models give some sort of scores, which are all combined to come up with one number at the end of it, which is the bottom of the slide, which indicates the probability of COVID infection for the participant. So this is all the tool gives, and this score is all we want to use to uh, uh, leverage to take decisions of COVID or non-COVID for the participant. So the symptoms data that we used were essentially these eight uh, key uh, symptoms, which included fatigue, muscle pain, loss of smell and taste, and so forth. So the, what we did was to just make it a binary sort of vector, meaning uh, presence of that symptom was one, absence of the symptom was zero, and then you got an eight dimensional binary vector. We used a decision tree model for classifying those symptoms. Right, so pretty much uh, the standard machine learning approaches, the classical approaches to do this task. How do we evaluate what we are doing? Uh, we use the standard metrics also. So the model, as I mentioned, gives you one real number, which is some score. On the score, you have to apply some sort of a threshold saying that if the score is above a value, then you detect that uh, participant or you classify that participant as a COVID positive individual. And then, you know, using the number of folks who got predicted as COVID positive divided by the total number of folks in your testing pool that are actually positive through the RT-PCR testing. This gives you the true positive rate or what is called a sensitivity and a true negative rate, which is exactly the same measure on the non-COVID uh, pool of participants. This is the specificity measure. One could then go ahead and change this threshold and for each value of threshold, you get two measures, the sensitivity and the specificity, and you could come up with curves, which are called the receiver operating curves and measure the area under this curve. A larger value of the area under this curve means that you are doing well with your test and ideal performance being about 50, about 100%. And of course, if you just blindly say positive negative, then you are the chance performance of what is called 50% area under the curve. Right. So a simple metric at the end, what is what you use as the area under the curve to quantify if we are making progress. So let's just uh, jolt down to the results in the next couple of minutes. So what are the area under the curve results telling us in this uh, setting? Right. So we have different modalities uh, uh, that we are using to perform this analysis. I'll try to tease apart what each modality, what story each modality is telling us. And then I will also show the combined case. So let us walk through the first three, which is the breathing, the cuff, and the speech signals. They give around 75 to 80% in terms of the area under the curve. These are all individual different modalities of uh, the sounds that we have collected. And since we found that all three of them are different ways of analyzing the respiratory system, the scores that are coming out of them were not really well correlated, which enabled us to combine those three itself, a simple fusion with just taking the average of this course, push the area under the curve to something like 84%. The symptom data, which is essentially the collection of the eight taught symptoms that I mentioned to put it through a decision tree classifier, that was also around 75 to 80% in terms of the area under the curve. This is also reported by other researchers that you get around 75 to 80% using the symptom data for COVID. And now you put the two and two together then what you start seeing is that if you combine the informations coming out of acoustics and the modality of the symptoms, you get around 92, 93% in terms of the area under the curve. So this 92, 93%, what does it really look like? Let us try to look at what uh, a particular threshold value says about this. So what you see here is the so-called confusion matrices. 
the x or the vertical axis is uh, the the y axis or the vertical axis is really the true labels so there is the non covid and the covid and the x or the horizontal axis is really the algorithm's prediction so you ideally want a completely diagonal matrix here where all the entries are only along the diagonal and the non diagonal entries are zero but what you see here is the operating point that we keep here for the threshold is 95% specificity rate means that you do you want, do not want much of false alarms in the system you want only about 5% false alarms the true negative rate was fixed at 95% and then what you see is that what is the true positive rate for this specificity and combining the modalities which is really the uh, matrix on the on the right that i would like you to focus on gives you around 69% specificity. So this is really uh, the uh, specificity sensitivity operating point that we get with the tool at this current stage of analysis. And putting the, that into context, I'll just mention the key summary with this slide and I stop my presentation there. I know I'm already over time now. So the key summary, which is the second bullet, is really saying that around 95% specificity operating point, you get around 69% sensitivity. And this is really the benchmark that has been set by the regulatory bodies, particularly in India, and we have seen it with several other nations. The benchmark of this uh, testing tools are 9550. So even with acoustics, even with the uh, symptom data and acoustics, with the participants spending just about five minutes of time with the tool, you can already build and put together a, a machine learning algorithm that can exceed the threshold set by regulatory bodies. And uh, the key other point is that the result or the score generation from the tool takes a few seconds after the participants click the upload button. So it's going to be as fast as about 30 seconds to know your COVID result. So the findings we have it as a research uh, under peer review at this point, this is the link that I have. And uh, last but not least, I would also like to you know, emphasize to the broad audience that we have here, if you feel that you know, there is a need for you know, broad population level testing, with you know uh, simplicity speed low cost and outreach to the masses uh, with uh, you are you know we welcome all of you to also participate in the data collection any age any health group any geography uh, any culture that you belong to you know we would like uh, you to spend five to seven minutes of time your data will also go into the pool and that will enrich our analysis and model building processes so that's all I wanted to you know, say in terms of the technical content. And of course, I was presenting most of the work, but this is thanks largely to the massive efforts put together by all the team members here, students, postdoctoral fellows, uh, uh, medical professionals at different uh, hospitals in the country. This is all a, a, a collaborative effort with all of them. And thank you very much again for your attention and thanks to Pat Chick for providing us the platform to talk about this. The other details in the social media handles, in our GitHub, you could also find data if you're interested in the data analysis side of these things. And the, also the website I mentioned, which is could, could be used for you to volunteering your data. Thank you again for you know, your patient attendance. Uh, thanks, thanks a lot, Dr. Sriram. That was a really interesting talk, and I can already see there are a few questions out here. So, I think we can start taking the questions at this moment. And um, so, we'll have a bit of Q and A for now, and then afterwards we can stop the recording and live stream and have a close room discussion if uh, the if there is interest for that as well. So, at the moment, I'll start with the questions. Uh, so there, uh, I can see a question from uh, Tao. So his question is uh, for you, Dr. Sriram, is uh, thanks for the wonderful innovation. What were the non-COVID controls used to calculate specificity? Uh, and were there non-COVID viral pneumonias, bacterial pneumonias, or other LRTIs? Also, how, do, how did the positive predictive values look like? Thanks. Yes, so I will, if I can, I will jolt down uh, straight to that slide. So uh, the non-COVID, if you see here, was about uh, 1,400 odd samples that was in the analysis thus far. Uh, so about 8%, if I'm, if I, about 6% of them had respiratory ailments. So this is about 70 to 80 participants uh, had respiratory ailments. Of course, these respiratory ailments were of you know, pneumonia nature, 
uh, we also had participants who had the uh, asthmatic conditions uh, there was a small subset uh, who were having uh, mild tuberculosis in their uh, uh, previous history so uh, the we did not particularly have you know enough data to one condition uh, or the other what we just took a view was you know given the data uh, analysis and data collection is progressing we just grouped the entire pool of non covid into this and it included folks having these respiratory ailments and the few and the analysis that we did we particularly did not find the pneumonia or asthmatic patients moving more towards covid the we were you know we are finding that the models were doing a reasonable job of of separating those uh, uh, conditions against covid of course our uh, testing may be you know Uh, on small sample size and this is something that you know hopefully in the future with the data collection with the efforts that are currently underway we could further uh, improve upon awesome uh, thank you thanks for that answer and i have getting one more question uh, is that did we see any particular in in your specific analysis again to dr sriram uh did you see anything particular uh with respect to the change in the second wave uh, as far as india is concerned so were there difference in the acoustic samples were there difference in the uh, sensitivity or accuracy of the models so, yeah i think that's an excellent question a, a, a part of that question we had tried to address in the draft you know for sake of brevity i could not go into those details uh, in this uh, presentation so if you uh, uh, start uh, seeing that you know in the tool we also asked the participants Uh, if they are exposed to the virus you know this could be let's say healthcare professionals could be doctors uh, could be other uh, primary contacts of covid infected individuals so they know that they were exposed to the virus through their primary contacts or through you know their job or day to day life and they mark in the tool as they are exposed to the virus so we had essentially a pool of participants who were exposed to the virus in the so called first wave in the country which was pretty much about the second half of last year and then these uh, two months that uh, started from april onwards till the end of may or to the middle of may till which this analysis has been undertaken on so we looked at these participants and we started seeing that the model the model what did not see the data from both of them when it was built and this uh, observation set or held out set we had and we looked at whether this was showing any difference and to our uh, interesting surprise the folks who self reported as exposed in the second wave of virus were getting scores which are as close to covid positive individuals in some cases as close to moderately infected covid positive individuals so there was a a, a large section of the folks who got, who were marked exposed and their scores were moving towards the so called uh, uh, covid positive categories the second thing we also analyzed was this recovered category you see that there is a category of participants who are marked as recovered from covid we did not use them for training and even the results that i presented did not present on those data pool but we separately analyzed it and some of them who marked as recovered in the second wave tended to have this acoustic biomarker that reflected like a covid positive it may well be that they re uh, they recovered uh, you know from uh, the infection uh, only about a week's time or so has been passed and maybe the acoustic system has not gotten reset but this was another change in the uh, data that we started observing after the second wave i see um, that's that's pretty interesting to know about it and uh, yeah i will look forward to reading more about it in your preprint as well so uh, thanks for sharing that link with us uh, so another question which i can see is uh, as you had mentioned in your data samples there were uh, nine classes and now since this data collection has been going on for some time uh, do you see a possibility that uh, you could reduce the classes let's say just ask the people to take one of those uh, one of which you feel find most important while at the same time use techniques like transfer learning or meta learning to make sure that your model transfers its previous knowledge about the other eight or n other k classes um, yeah. I, i yeah so again a very good question I, i don't know the full answer to you know at least whether we could go to one but maybe we could have a subset of these categories so but what uh, we felt was when we designed this tool uh, having these uh, subsets for example each of them if you look at shallow breathing or a deep breathing cycle 
each of these signals that the participant records is a matter of few seconds. So a shallow breathing cycle recording is about 10 seconds of audio. The deep breathing similar, the cough sound, so and the vowel sounds maybe 15 to 20 seconds. So essentially the amount of acoustic data that we are collecting and the effort involved that also uh, feedback that we, are, uh, we obtained was about equivalent to talking on the phone for about three to five minutes. So this was the effort from the participant side. But what we also saw, as you saw in the, in the analysis, putting these different modalities together sort of made the final push. That may you know, eventually become the difference between going through the approvals or not. While transfer learning, other machine learning approaches surely might uh, you know, help in future when we have more data and so forth. This, remember, uh, to a key point to note is this is really a crowdsource setting. Users are calling from multiple different acoustic environments. They could be in isolation wards, they could be in hospital centers, or they could be in, at their home. They could be out in the open while trying to record this. And the other thing that you also see in the data is the device variability all different sorts of smart uh, phone uh, you know, devices have been used. You would see the high-end smartphone based uh, acoustic recordings coming through, which are relatively clean. And you also see the uh, low-end uh, smartphone mobile users providing the data, which the data quality is also compromised. So we have been you know, seeing, and secondly, the other issue is the network coverage. So we also saw that some participants try to record go through the process, but the network fails and there is a packet loss in the audio that you receive. So combining all this, you know, there was a quality check that we did and that took us quite a bit of time actually to look at these recordings, see, you know, where is really these issues that are coming through and to try to build towards these robust models that can go over it. We felt at least till now our consensus within the team has been to keep all these nine categories Maybe in you know, a future analysis, if we find that a subset of them are sufficient enough to generate the level of modeling accuracies, we might you know, try to limit it. Absolutely, that, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, again, I am seeing a question from Dr. Hudson to you, Dr. Sridham. So uh, the question is, uh, as you mentioned earlier that there were biomarkers present to understand people who had exposure, especially in the second uh, wave when it happened. So uh, Dr. Hudson's question is more along if this could be used to track long COVID sufferers and your take on that. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hudson. You know, this is a, uh, first of all, I would like to also further add to that, that, you know, there's an audio, you could also open your audio and ask the question, you know, through your audio feed as well, you know. Just, oh, uh, yeah, I know. I was like, I thought, Rohan. <laughs> Yeah, uh, this is just an acoustic stop. So I, I just mentioned it. Nothing. I, I <laughs> <get> to, <laughs> uh, the, the question that you asked. So totally, you know, we are actually finding that the acoustic biomarker. So, you know, I had one of my, you know, unfortunately, one of my students, uh, her, uh, student also contracted COVID during the second wave. And we, uh, you know, she said she has completely, uh, you know, recovered from it. It's almost three weeks after the onset of the infection. And uh, all her symptoms, uh, uh, she said, were you know quite normal. And then we uh, asked her to record her data. And even on her data, when we passed it through the tool, we found that the scores were pretty high, meaning the acoustic biomarkers were still present even after about three weeks from the onset of the infection. So something that really happens within the country, I'm not exactly sure whether this is the status in the states and elsewhere, uh, is that you know people tend to. Uh, go get tested on the onset of the infection. And once they basically feel that their body has recovered, their, uh, uh, their loss of smell and taste has come back, they assume that you know, their COVID infection has left them. So this uh, uh, you know, tool, we also would like to see more and more data on these recovered categories as to how long these uh, symptoms linger. And that may also indicate some other complications if they might have like long COVID as you're saying. Mm. Thanks. Oh, thanks. Thanks Dr. Sriyam for that. Uh, another question was what, what obstacles are folks in India utilizing your tools facing? Is the cell phone usage because enough in India to provide access to the tool to the uh, poorer subaltern population? 
So uh, I think the cell phone access is 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 a pretty large pool, like particularly the smartphone you know access. Uh, 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 I do not know the exact statistics of how much is the outreach, but you know uh, uh, the broad level of consensus is that the cell phone outreach, even web connection to cell phones with you know, has been significant enough that uh, there is a, a a large population of mobile users with web connection. what may be the, the benchmark the let us say bottlenecks that we faced first of all there was you know a questions about even the validity of the hypothesis you know is it really even possible to you know have voice or sounds to tell uh, from the really this is going from the symptom side of covid it's not at trying to understand the biology or the genomics of the virus this is at the symptom level at the acoustic level of it that was the first question and secondly it's related partly to the question that uh, one of our audience members had raised you know what about other respiratory disorders will these sort of tools can you know provide the distinction between a viral a fungal or a bacterial infection that affects the uh, respiratory system so this you know are where the two key bottleneck questions that we were asked and secondly you know in the initial wave of infections in the country the earlier wave the india uh, you know fortunately didn't have that much of an uh, out surge in the viral uh, infection and the most of the data we also co- started collecting was of the healthy nature so it was heavily biased towards you know having about 1000 po- uh, healthy individuals and about a bunch of covid positive intelligence this was our uh, you know data uh, distribution for about first 4 5 months of our data collection then we started going through the regulatory uh, you know processes of different hospitals Uh, trying to work with you know medical uh, practitioners and through the ethical approval so that took us some time to convince the uh, hospital uh, uh, you know uh, administrative bodies to get along to do this kind of uh, targeted data collection and that now has been you know set on 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 its place and so forth in the uh, the last 2 3 months our data collection particularly targeting more covid positive individuals and also the diversity that we want in the data you know while india we say as a country you know uh, most of us most of you would know that there is a large diversity and uh, geographic uh, uh, variability within the country itself different cultures languages uh, and all these we do not even uh, uh, know how much of this would be you know uh, visible in the acoustics like uh, speech and like uh, cough and all that so again and now also we are trying to get the outreach beyond the country to uh, you know other uh, continents and other nations to get data so we want to see what uh, you know nations in east asia in africa in the states and europe you know what those sort of acoustics would the uh, variabilities that would bring and there would also be perhaps you know mutants that are different in these geographies that may also uh, have its impact on the acoustics so we are really like you know trying to uh, extend collaborations and also trying to uh, get more folks interested to participate and and provide data that's also one of the reasons why i mentioned made the pitch for data from all the audience out here so this will help us understand build the tool more robustly to different cultures and one last thing i would like to mention we actually made an international special session on one of these uh, uh, speech conferences this is called the inter speech and that attracted about 85 teams uh, uh, from all across the globe from the states the europe and so forth and there was you know a very you know, widespread interest in participating in it and most of the teams about 20 to 25 teams uh, uh, performed really well and also wrote their findings so the data that we prepared we also made uh, some uh, technology challenges for more people to participate and also investigate approaches to do this diagnostics that's that's wonderful dr sridham and uh, that's that's great to have a sort of shared task uh, thing on inter speech and i'm sure that there would left a lot of uh, more data points coming in uh, on that note uh, feel free to join our slack group as well we have an international community of more than 3000 people and i'm sure many would be willing to spend the 5 to 7 minutes that could make a difference over here so right absolutely so, we'll uh, do that thank you thank you for the pointer yeah yeah definitely thanks um so i have another question over here and this for dr hudson um so the question is are there analogous social justice and health disparity issues in india that are leaving a certain portion of the population at greater risk what are correlations to uh, we face here in the us so i'm i'm guessing this question is uh, targeted towards dr hudson 
but uh, others also feel free to answer if you think you have an answer as well. So Dr. Hudson, uh, we'd like to hear your thoughts. Um, I don't have all of the information yet. Um, from what I've been told so far, it sounds like it's a lot of similar issues about not trusting the government, um, not trusting the healthcare system, not having access to healthcare, um, and just, you know, disinformation as well, being distrustful about the development of the vaccine. Um, I think we're working now to understand more about, <clears throat> I don't know, specific, maybe cultural context, but like you said, you know, India is also not a monolith, so there's going to be like regional nuances and different different things that we should had to try to figure out. And so. right, right, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I I think this is an interesting question. I think this is you know like what are what are the pa parallels, right? And I'm you know I think people probably that are living in India would know better than than us here in the U.S. about what the answer yeah. question is. <laughs> um, you know, one, one difference that I've just noticed is the use of WhatsApp, I think is, is particularly, <laughs> um, a big thing in India and, and not so much here in terms of spreading sure. information about COVID. But if there are people who are living in India that want to answer this question, I'd be very curious. Yeah, I did. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I am not, uh, you know, uh, I am not, let us say, uh, really a, a you know, let us say, informed about the policies and, and the vaccine outreach per se. But uh, the, the slight difference that you find here, maybe compared to the US, I don't think the distrust is really the, the concern here. The access to the vaccine has been, you know, sort of an issue. First of all, there has been, you know, requirements for everyone to be registered in an online portal and everybody has to have their original identity cards to you know, register through this and get access to the vaccine. And second thing, the vaccine availability, you know, based on private uh, 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 you know, health centers, you know, there is a cost issue for the private health centers. The government recently has announced a free you know, access to the vaccines, but the vaccine availability itself has been limited. And to register through these uh, uh, portals uh, 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 for you know the large masses has been a sort of an issue that has prevented or at least uh, had an impact in more people coming in into the system. So uh, hopefully this will happen over the course of the months and the weeks uh, that uh, the vaccine outreach and access is going to improve. Uh, but you know this is really you know a, a real work in progress. I mean, right. I mean, that's another thing, right? That vaccine availability is, is, you know, low, right? So people are more worried about having, just having the vaccine than, you know, hesitancy at this point. Um, Do Dr. Advani, uh, who's uh, wrote in the chat to the panelists, health literacy is a huge challenge as is trust in vaccines in is low in rural areas. And sorry, my cell phone is ringing. Um, so uh, I mean, I think that is similar, right, to the US that there's a that trust is lower in rural areas than in city areas. Yeah, I agree, totally. Okay. Uh, the, yeah, the trust and also the information availability as to uh, 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 how and what the vaccine does and why uh, one needs to be protected. This information uh, access is also a concern. So, uh, you know, trained professionals uh, uh, providing, you know, right information, uh, that surely is a concern, you know, uh, across the country also, similar to what uh, Dr. Hudson was mentioning in her talk. So, you know, access to the right information is surely, you know, there are some odd cases of uh, some issues and all that, you know, that becomes, you know, really the, the headline, so as to speak. Right. Definitely. Uh, I guess then uh, my second next question to Dr. Hudson sort of piggybacking on this. Uh, it's uh, in, based on your experience in uh, being able to serve the right information or preventing misinformation, making sure the right message is delivered. Uh, what sort of uh, major bottlenecks have you faced? And uh, let's say, do you support um, or, or do you think a fully automated system makes sense over here? 
um, like we, we, we can see like a lot of uh, ML based systems, NLP based systems that are out there trying to find fake news. Uh, and I just wanted to know what your thoughts are on it. Uh, do you think a human in the loop system is much better? Although scalability is an issue and likewise. I'm sorry, um, and with regards to education, is that what you're? Uh, in general about uh, spreading of misinformation or spreading of factual information. Uh, so uh, uh, do you I see. Yeah. 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 Um, I think it has to be both. I mean, you know, I just spoke a little bit about our sort of, um, I guess, social media content. Um, but, you know, I don't know. I've been, I've been ruminating about this a lot lately because, you know, we, we also have like the podcast and we try to like find avenues, you know, through like town halls and satellite radio, whatever we can do, right? But I honestly have been thinking about like, you know, there, we're getting into some project work in terms of um, developing like methods of, of communicating and like having like bi-directional communication with certain, you know, community segments um, to sort of help refine our messaging um, through successive like iterations. Um, but I, you know, I've been wondering lately, like if, if we shouldn't like take on some of the, the tactics of, um, of all the perpetrators of disinformation, right? Cause it's like, it's, um, you know, if they're nothing else, they're brilliant propagandists brilliant you know and it, i think i've been thinking about different ways to exploit some of those techniques to spread the truth for a change you know what i mean so i don't know <laughs> yeah. i mean i i think i think that's one thing i think also just exposing um how people are profiting off that you know a yeah. lot of the people getting this misinformation are have money to be made that way right and just showing how pernicious that is, that it's actually predatory, mm. these practices. Yeah. Yeah, that too. I think, there's a, I think there's an avenue for both. I think you have to have some sort of AI involved. It has to be a human machine interaction um, on a lot of levels, just because of the way we consume our information, but also it's important to have that human connection because we're talking about like um you know like a trust issue too we're trying to shift people's thinking so they they're not even going to listen if they don't um have a connection you know with you so. yeah i mean you were talking about something with google right where they were something like had stopped the 20 20 percent of people from yeah they were they were they developed, you know, some of those like, um, you know, user interface prompts. Um, and I've seen, I've seen them here and there on social media, but like, you know, like if you are getting ready to share a story that is like, has been flagged as like false news, you know, they'll prompt you to like consider that this might not be true or just little different, the tips that they give now, like on Facebook and stuff to, say you know make sure you know you check your source or whatever like that they showed in their experimental setting that the focus group they used it was reduced 20 percent um but one of the things that they noted was that a potential limitation is that that effect might wear off too right like people might have fatigue of like going through that sort of uh, vetting step um, and again you know it's kind of about the way that we consume things right so I think and there's an emotional component too so that's why I met and sort of trying to find ways to exploit the tactics of um, the spreaders of disinformation because there's ways to um, use the same methods to you know whatever it is pull up somebody's heartstrings make them laugh or just somehow engage them um, in a way that in their mind allows them to believe that whatever they're seeing is true because they've made some unconscious connection to it, you know, so. Yeah, I, I kind of think about emotional valence with that, right? So we know, like, the more emotion something is 
bringing out, the more people are likely to click on it, remember it, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. So, and, and that emotion could be outrage, which is a lot of the news. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but I, I think it could also be, you know, joy or laughter or something positive. I don't know what the studies are comparing positive emotional valence to negative emotional valence. It's a quick rate, but... <laughs> <laughs> and then, I think yeah. the other problem is that people aren't talking and some of the other work that the media lab did show that you know when they're mapping conversations you know there at least in the U.S. there's like this huge like clear <laughs> disparity between the clusters of people who are sort of Republican QAnon identifying all those people with the conspiracy theories and then like the rest of people um, who read um, and, you know, they could kind of see that, like, all of the, like, journalists and all of the, you know, media sources were on the side with the truth and all of those things, um, but that there was no connection between that and the fringe group, right? The fringe group is, like, on its own, and not only that, but the density of um, connections between them and the, and the amount of stuff they propagated within the group was so much larger than in the truth group. So it's spreading faster and people just keep reposting, you know, so many things amongst their echo chamber. So there's a lot of issues. I don't know, there's a way, I mean, even here, I think that it's important to target those groups because, um, you know, they're still vectors, you know, at the end of the day. Um, nothing is reasonable about what we have to endure, you know, sharing a country with them, but they're still vectors of disease. So if we can get to them too and get them to stop spreading it, that would be amazing. Yeah, I mean, that's what I think about with outrage. Like people should be outraged that people are profiting off of spreading disinformation that then kills people, right? This is what I think about. Like, you know, even QAnon, right, is related to 8chan, which is like the dark underbelly of 4chan, right? And you look at what what people stand to benefit from. I mean, they have a place that they have so many users and users equal dollars, right? Yep. So, you know, when you get people upset and you get them to click on things and you get them to use your platform, you make a lot of money off of that. So in a sense, this is blood money that people are, (laughs) seriously, right? Because people are dying of COVID from this misinformation and profiting off of it. And I think, you know, that that is an outrageous (laughs) headline that needs to be propagated, uh, I think. And that's part of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, just uh, uh, one comment on uh, what uh, Christine was mentioning, right? I mean, at least, you know, I'm aware of some studies which show that uh, uh, negative emotions, you pay about uh, three times more sensitivity to than like positive emotions. So, you know, if there is a news, if there is mm-hmm. a piece of comment that, you know, allows us negative emotions, you are three times more likely to pay attention to it. So that's why, you know, the, the newspaper, the media, they know it, you know, that's why you see more negative news than positive news, if you will. So, you know, you feed off it, right? So more people read it, more people propagate it and so forth. And that's true in misinformation too, you know, when it's negative, yeah. it's, you tend to spread more. That's why I keep going back and forth with like, it's a slippery slope, I think, because even though their tactics are successful, obviously, do we also want to like become part of that paradigm of that's how we propagate information? It's just, like bombarding people mm-hmm. with like, you know, yeah. it's like, it's necessary right now, but what we really need to do is change the way that we communicate, you know? Yeah. I, yeah. I, I, I agree with that. I, I mean, I, you know, the neuroscientist in me, of course, is always interested in, in this sort of like the, <laughs> the psychology and neuroscience behind this, but, you know, yeah. I think it's probably able to be split by people as well because you know, Facebook has these algorithms for your newsfeed where they tell you this, they keep feeding you the stuff that you click on the most, right? So I've noticed this because Mm -hmm. my own Facebook feed is like this weird alternative universe of like unicorns and rainbows and like 
kids' birthday right. candles. And it's like so weirdly positive <laughs> that like, I like don't, <laughs> I think maybe this says something to me right. about being like avoidant of new <laughs> things. Cause I'm just clicking <laughs> on all the positive stuff, right? <laughs> and it's right. giving me this like world where, you know, like there is no bad things in the world. And like, clearly that's not true. So I, I wonder if there's like studies to be done about what individual people are clicking on and, mm. you know, like <laughs> who is spending time where, um, but Correct. yeah. And, and also these, you know, these uh, machines, right? You know, they want you to stay as much on Facebook or any of the social media as, as long as you can. So the way they do it is to customize it. So that you know, you live in your own reality. You live with uh, or communicate with folks who have the similar opinion. So you you essentially click on their links and they click on your links. So it becomes like you know you build a, a circle of your own reality, if you will, and around which you know most of the opinions that you learn and and feed upon are are aligned with yours. Yeah, so I that, mean, that's really the. It's not good. I mean, it's not good in both regards, right? Like if, if, it, if right. I was getting all my news on my own Facebook feed, it's like all healthcare workers like smiling with their vaccine cards. I wouldn't even know there was vaccine hesitancy, right? Because I like literally don't see it in my yeah. feed. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Uh, so I guess uh, I just uh, put some Okay, I have done with all the questions and in the interest of time, I'll uh, stop the recording as well. So just before that, uh, once again, thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Hudson and Dr. Sridhar for uh, spending a lot of this time with us and uh, for the amazing talk and the even better discussion that we were having right now. And we look forward to having more such discussions and collaborations with you as well. And yeah. Thank you. So, thank, you uh, thank you. Thank you and other organizers. Right. Thank Absolutely. you. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Hudson, for your thank insights. Thank you. <laughs> I'd, uh, I'd like to bring attention to everyone if uh, please join our Slack work uh, workspace at tiny.cc Patrick Slack and uh, check out the previous talks at tiny.cc PCF research talks and uh, with that um, see you on July 8th where we have the next presentation of the Global Health Innovators where we have speakers uh, Brian Wilder, Anurag Mairal and Madhu Marate and we look forward to seeing more of you on this talk as well. Uh, thank you. Thanks a lot. And uh, I'll be stopping the recording right now.